good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this would be a tough follow up con considering the panel before. Uh, that was a very interesting one. I am Avi Alex. I am a solution architect at AWS. Now, this is slightly a different perspective to what you would normally encounter in terms of any kind of a game development discussion. Um, what we're trying to do here is maybe, you know, slightly switch your lens in the way you look at game development. Um, I had a good chance to basically walk around, talk to people around here and folks who are coming in and speaking with us to see exactly and understand how game developers in India, game startups in India actually look at game development. We're trying to slightly shift your lens to see whether you can look at it from a slightly different perspective. So there are a couple of questions which gets repeatedly asked to us. One of them is, uh, do I need an architecture? And where is my one game backend? Now, a quick show of hands from the audience. Um, how many of you are game developers? Game designers? Um, founders, startup founders? Okay, how many of you think that game architecture is required? And what about the rest? Okay, let's say you are supposed to be building this building. Would you need a diagram? Can you build it without an architecture diagram? How many of you say you can build it without an architecture diagram? Show your hands up. Just look around the room. Anyone saying you can build this hall without an architecture diagram? Just one. That's good confidence. You have one of the right brothers uh, who might have made the plane without a diagram. But then, uh, interestingly, for every other domain and field which is out there, you will not be able to build anything without an architecture diagram and you basically say, let's get on building a game without even an idea of what would it mean to scale. And if you're listening to the panel interview before, one of the nuances which we found within the Indian gaming development is we don't look at all the facets. We look at the game design, we look at the game play, we do not look at how the game would scale. And the moment the game goes viral, and this is one of the interesting things which we have been uh, when we are talking with customers that we find that the moment the game goes viral, you need to suddenly figure out how do you cater to 1,000 players? How do you cater to 10,000 players? How do you cater to 100,000 players? Now, there's an interesting anecdote. There was um, uh, uh, one of the customers which we were working with very closely uh, just called up at 8 p.m. At, in the evening saying, tomorrow morning we have a campaign launch which has gone across newspapers in India and we are having around 100,000 players coming in at 6 a.m. in the morning and we need to get up and running. Can you do that for your game? Now, I know this diagram looks complicated. There are a lot of things. My intent is to just simplify it. Now, when we are speaking all of it, a lot of times you might have heard of, heard like, okay, walk the talk. Now, when we are talking about architecture, we're just not talking about it. Uh, as AWS, as Amazon, we built a game, which is a multiplayer game, go out and try it out. It's by the name The New World. And it's built with our services, which basically can help you gather that many number of players and run with that many number of players. So the second follow-up question, which I generally get is, um, I know how to use the game engine. I know how to use, build, use and build the net code. Give me one backend. Give me one service which does it all. But here's the interesting insight. Uh, this is from Wikipedia, so I, I will not call it out. But you know what a game engine does. You know what a net code does. But then, what else would a backend do? Uh, that's a hefty list of things which your backend would be required to do as part of a game. Your player authentication, in-game purchases, uh, game state, leaderboard, achievements, matchmaking. Now, you, you, you're kind of expecting that one thing would solve all. But let me ask you this question. From all the game developers out here, anyone who thinks their game backend is similar or the game features which they expect in their game is similar to the game features in any other game. Anyone should put up your hand who says, okay, my game backend features is exactly the same as the other game. What are you trying to do? You're trying to differentiate it. You're trying to make it unique. If you're trying to make it unique, then it also basically calls out for something which is specific to your game, which is, can I have those game backend features which is core to my gaming portfolio? which is core to my gaming cinematic universe, which is core to my games, which I intend to develop within my genre. And that's where I come to the salt and pepper kind of analogy. There are two things which will help you out. One, which we call databases, and the second, which we call compute. 
Now, how do they help you out? These are the two core elements which is required to build any kind of game banking. Now, what we mean by that is you might need to probably maintain a certain kind of game state, you might need to maintain certain type of relationship between players, uh, you might have a social game, each one of them would require different type of data to be maintained and that's where database comes in and that's where AWS has different types of databases to offer based on your individual needs. Now, when I show this many types of databases, does that mean you will have to use all of that? No. It just basically means that when you get started, knowing that a database is there to help you out helps. So you figure out which is the one which works for you best and at the same time, you also find out how would you build your backend. Now, the question which gets often asked is, is this just enough? Do I just use a computer and a database? Well, 95 to 99% of everything which you build is using a data storage and requires a hardware to run. So technically, these are the two things which you just need to get started. But then where does the variance starts? You will have to look at the nuances inside your game backend and depending on the kind of features which you want to introduce, I'll just go back to the slide so that you get a sense, depending on different kinds of features you would want to introduce, you may cherry pick between one or more than one database. You may cherry pick between one or more than one compute kind of an offering. So essentially, you will look at your requirements in terms of your backend and look at what you need. Now, then this kind of is counterintuitive to what you kind of think about, like, let me have one backend, not necessary. Why don't you build one backend for your entire game genres you are targeting, which is custom made for what you really want to achieve. Now, once you have that, um, it's an Indian setup. You can't have anything without garam masala, so you have to have some secret sauce and extra sauce. So a couple of extra things, or tools rather, which can help you a long way. And, and, and specifically, I'll highlight five of them. Uh, one is what we call as an API gateway, a quick one to basically expose your APIs. Second is a load balancer. Now, how many of you know what a load balancer is? Show of hands. Good, so that helps me not get into the details of load balancer, but in a similar fashion, you have something called as a cloud front. Anyone who's heard a content distribution network? Okay, for those who have not heard what a cloud front is, uh, a content distribution network is essentially what caches your content so that the games can be accessed much quicker. So, um, who is irritated with a download a mobile game download which takes probably, you know, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Anyone who likes to have long game downloads? No. So if, if that's the case, you want to have an accelerated game downloads, you want to have an accelerated game assets, you need to have small, small, small servers which are distributed across India, across the globe, which can help you get those content much faster. And that's where CloudFront comes in. Um, similarly, you need, about, uh, need to have security. Now, here's an interesting conversation which I had yesterday. Uh, how many of you, when you were students, uh, tried to hack a game or crack a game or get the license from somewhere or let the code? Anyone who has played a hack, well, I, I shouldn't be saying that, but then. <laughs> so so if, if, if you know that you are one of those gamers who are trying to break the game, you should also know that your game would be broken by somebody who's a student who's trying to figure out how your game works. So you need something to secure it, and that's where WAF comes in. That's a web application firewall. And the cheapest storage, which is there, which is simple uh, Amazon S3 simple storage service. So essentially, this is our extra secret sauce which will help you build your game very uh, efficiently. Now, keeping these three things in mind, if I go back to this complicated diagram which you saw right at the beginning, it's just using these three components a compute, a database, and those extra few spices just to get your game up and running. Now, you would see multiple different gaming booths which are just outside. Feel free to go and ask to them as to whether they work on run on AWS, how they use AWS, and you'll be interested. You'll be actually seeing multiple different insights in terms of how these architectures, these game architectures, have actually made a difference in the way they have built the games and the way the players are experiencing it. Now that comes to the live part of it. I know the title is slightly misleading. You might have see, thought about seeing a live game, but what I wanted to bring to the audience was essentially what it would mean to make a live game architecture. And I realized right at the booth that there are a couple of session-based games who are actually demonstrating their games. And, and feel free to just talk to them to understand what their game backend would look like. But let's take one of those games, or just as an example, it's a session-based game and it's a multiplayer game. Uh, what would it mean 
to basically get that game across to 1,000 players? What would it mean to get that game across 10,000, 100,000 players? And that's where, well, if, if you had reached out to me and say, look, I'm building this game, I want to know how to make it scalable, I want to make sure that game can run across multiple number of plays when it goes viral, I'll probably ask you two questions. One, what is your game currently hosted on? How do you think about scaling? How many sessions would you want to scale on, uh, scale to? Um, and that's where we have a service which is by the name Amazon Game Lift, which is a service which is used for game hosting. Now, Technically, when you say or speak about game hosting, you'll think, okay, I have a game, I'm running it on a server, and my job is done. But then my work increases from there. What happens right now, let's say you have a game, when, within one session you have five players and it runs on one server. Uh, tomorrow it has 100 players. How many servers would you need? Probably 20. 100,000, how many servers would you need? And let's say one of the servers, for an example, costs $1. And right now you have an eSports tournament running. Are you going to spend $100,000 for that entire match? Are you going to let have that many number of servers running continuously? That would probably not, you not even have that much amount of money to just basically run that many games. Then can you have a better way to basically run your game? And that's where game lift and scaling comes into play, which basically means when you have one player, you have one server. When you have 100,000 players, you might have 100,000 servers if required. But once the game is done, it will come back to one. So that's where the game lift and the scaling comes into play. So any of the large gaming studios you, or any of the large games you play, multiplayer games you play, don't think, at it, think of it as they're putting 100,000 servers behind it. They are just increasing the number of servers when you just log in to play just about the time when you need it. So they keep their costs optimized. Now along with that, we spoke about two things. I need a data storage. I'll suggest DynamoDB, which is a global table, uh, a global setup where you want to, if you want to have tables uh, across the globe and players across the globe. Uh, Lambda is one of our compute off offerings. Now, all these three put together, I can say I can get you a session-based game up and running. But then, is that it? Let's break it down one more step. Um, what would it mean if it's a session-based game? I would have people coming in. I would want those people to basically join into a match probably. That's what we call the matchmaking part of it. I would want probably them to be matched up based on where they're trying to log in. So for instance, uh, how many of you have logged into a game and got a message which says, uh, finding a server close to you? Show of hands. Yeah, look around you. So those are folks who are playing multiplayer games. Essentially, what's happening is a small matchmaking which is happening and behind the scenes. And what it is trying to do is to find out those backend game servers which is closest to you. So it will basically identify the latency, it will use that as part of the matchmaking, figure out players who are close to you, and use that to come up with the final list of players who will be joining this match. And all of that is where these arrows come into play. So essentially, if you look at an architecture which has to be brought up out for a multiplayer session-based games, uh, a very simple workflow, you have a game client, works well, you have a game client which requests saying, I need to join a game. And it, uh, it sends that request to an API gateway, that sends to a Lambda, which then sends, tells it to GameLift saying, I want to find a match where I have other players who's close to me, is based on so-and-so skill, and then you get a match ready and essentially the entire workflow works through. So effectively, what you're looking at is essentially a simplistic architecture. So what you're looking at is a very simplistic architecture which builds upon whatever you have already done. Now here's the tricky part. Uh, whenever we are talking about this to any of the game developers, and I, I took some time to speak to a couple of the gaming uh, courses which are being taught, uh, a lot of time game backend or game backend is not something which you think which is essential to your game. Uh, and, and, and that is realized only when your game goes viral. Now I have an interesting question for you. How many of you want to change your game code after it has been developed? Show of hands. How often would you want to change it? Every day? Every month? Okay, there's one who wants to change every month. And, and, and let me rephrase that question once more. If your game goes viral, let's say one of um, the AIB team comes in and basically starts playing your game and does a vlog about it. And, it to, and the very next hour, maybe 1,500, 2,000 odd players are joining in. Who is ready to go and change your game code so that it can run? There are two hands. 
But do, can you, now the question to both of you just, I'm not putting you on the spot, but do you think you can finish off those changes within the next two hours? And the answer to that is no. And which is where I'm trying to re-emphasize this point that when you're thinking about building games, it's not necessary that you may integrate all of this, but keeping those in mind and knowing that these are the choices which you have when you build a game is very important because it helps you scale up your game. So a lot of times, instead of thinking about this after your game goes viral, why not start your game with an architecture which you think about it upfront and keep those placeholders when you build your game. And that brings us to the next part, which is when you start thinking about it, you can also start keeping those dotted lines which you put across are features which you might want to add later. So you can always think about, okay, what is that you want to add as a feature later? What is what you want to bring in as a roadmap? And when you have that thought process, these are not alterations or places where you break apart your game and rebuild it again. It's a logical growth or a logical evolution to your game. Uh, which brings us to the last uh, slide, and I won't bore you much because considering it's already noon and everyone is looking for lunch, uh, there are three points which you need to keep in mind. When you want to build a game to last, you need to have a driving architecture vision, which does not just include your engine and your net code, needs to go beyond that. Uh, the second thing, which is the most important one, which is understand your toolbox. So that's where AWS comes in and gives you a large variety of different types of services, uh, which in many ways is for your toolbox for creating your MCUs, in the sense that if you're an Avengers fan, it took a couple of years to build your MCU, but in the same way you can look at this being your backend cinematic universe in the way that you build one backend setup which can support multiple games. And once you have that in your architecture, the last and the most important one, let this backend grow and evolve along with your audience. So technically three points which you need to keep in mind. This architecture which you saw here, I'll just go back, run through those slides um, so that I can get to this. This one is not an architecture which was built within one iteration. It would have probably started with three or four boxes. Those three, four boxes, one more new game feature, one more box added. One more new game feature, one more box added. And it slowly and steadily evolved to a point where it is not just supporting one game for a gaming studio, it's supporting multiple different games. So the backend doesn't keep changing, just these features are being added. So essentially, when you are looking at opening up a game studio, think about your architecture, think about how it plays out, and think about what are the tools which you have in terms of a database, what are the tools which you have in terms of compute, and what are the other tools which you have in terms of extra sec adding security to the game, making sure it can be downloaded faster using CloudFront, and use all of those as a tool to design that architecture which can get your game to last beyond your lifetime in terms of what you're trying to build, and it can support multiple other games which you want to build. Now that brings an end to what I had to speak. Uh, just a quick conclusion before I wrap up and take questions if any. Uh, one, we have a booth which is just outside uh, the booth number one. Feel free to come in if you have a game which you're building, if you're a startup which you're coming up with new games. I'm a solution architect. I work with gaming startups across India to guide them in terms of how to build this architecture. So if you have questions, if you don't know where to start, if you just want to understand how this world works, feel free to drop over and just ask as many questions as you want. We are here to help you out and answer those. Uh, the second, um, for startups, there are AWS credits which you're offering. Uh, feel free to please drop by and see if you can pick some of those credits. It will help you quick get started on building on AWS. And it's, easy, it's an easy free thing which you can directly use, nothing much to worry about. Drop by our booth, you should be able to get those details and start working on it. And the last one, um, if you have any queries and you find it hesitant for you to just come down to a booth, or if you find questions which you would want to raise later, you can just drop a note or an email to us at gametech-india at amazon.com. Our team is sitting ever ready to answer to you. And interestingly, uh, this is one of the insights which I give to all the gaming startups which we talk to. Uh, the gaming team within Amazon loves to play and loves to build. So technically we are up 24 seven in the sense that you'll find either us talking to you guys in terms of how to build the games and when we are not talking to you guys, then we are actually playing the game. So feel free to write an email. We'll always reach out back to you and help you out with any questions you have or any answers or guidance you need. Thank you.
Uh, questions, if any, I can probably pick one or two. Or if not, I'll be out here. Features, or yeah. do you have a specific feature in mind? Uh, in terms of everything. So, um, a lot of the gaming studios already are building using game lift. Uh, one of the things which we have also realized is the Indian gaming community is not so much aware of how game lift is being used. So, I'm more than happy to chat with you and walk you through different customers globally are using it. Uh, within the Indian diaspora, gaming backend and gaming cloud gaming services and the services which is being, for example, um, let me give you a uh, slightly different perspective. Um, uh, there's a very nice video which is out there on YouTube where uh, the folks at Rovio, um, Angry Birds, um, have spoken about how they have used machine learning for game level design using reinforcement learning on AWS. So if you look at that spectrum, in terms of tech, globally, AWS has been used across a wide variety of games uh, for all, across all services, not just game lift. So game lift is in very one of our oldest service. It has been heavily being used by a lot of gaming startups. I'm more than happy to give you individual references. Um, and it's being not used for small games, for large multiplayer ones. It's, it's meant for multiplayer games. To the point we have um, an Indian gaming metaverse, which is also using it. I know the name. <laughs> Happy to have a one-to-one -one chat and walk sure. you through. <laughs> Feel free, please drop by with the booth and we can give you more details. <laughs> sure, sure.